Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, History Through the Pages, Nonfiction. I am Ronnie Curry, Associate Editor, Books for Youth at Booklist. Before we begin, I will go over some technical details. If you're in the audience, you are in listen-only mode, but we definitely welcome any questions you might have. So on the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or if you need technical assistance, simply click on Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. The Booklist team will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along all other questions to the panelists. If they don't have time to get to your questions today, they will have the opportunity to follow up with you directly after the webinar, so please do keep the questions coming. Links to today's slides were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download the slides at any time by copying the URL on this screen into your web browser. And today we have the pleasure of hearing from Candace Fleming, whose book, The Rise and Fall of Charles Lindbergh, was published in February. John Rocco, whose book, How We Got to the Moon, The People, Technology, and Daring Feats of Science Behind Humanity's Greatest Adventure, published in October and Cheryl Willis Hudson, whose book, Brave Black First, 50 Plus African American Women Who Changed the World, published in January. First, we will have the pleasure of hearing from Candace Fleming. Candace is the prolific and versatile author of many books for children and young adults. The Family Romanov received six starred reviews, won the Boston Globe Hornbook Award for Nonfiction, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, was a Siebert nonfiction honor book, and much more. Amelia Lost received four star reviews and won the Golden Kite Award for nonfiction. The Lincolns also won the Boston Globe Horn Book Award and many other prizes. Her many acclaimed picture books include Giant Squid, a Siebert honor book. Welcome, Candy. The floor is now yours. Thanks, Ronnie. Oops, okay, there he is. Oh, and there I am. Oh, great. Um, this is, I'm really excited to be here. I'm sure we're going to have this really great conversation. I wanted to start out with a couple of facts. I have to check my, my notes over here. Um, just a couple of facts um, that on the grounds of the Minnesota, or sorry, the Minnesota State Capitol, there's a statue of Charles Lindbergh. Um, there's also one at the San Diego airport, and there's one at Char Paris's Charles de Gaulle airport. Um, there are also 1,131 1, Lindbergh boulevards, avenues, and streets across the United States, as well as a dozen Lindbergh school districts and hundreds of individual Charles A. Lindbergh elementary, middle, and high schools. And I tell you this simply because it's proof of the tenacious grip that Charles Lindbergh still has on the American imagination. And there he is right there, that handsome, wholesome boy next door aviator who took the world by storm on his, in his solo flight in 1927 and became one of our nation's greatest hero, heroes. Next. There we go. And there he is, the hand, and there he is next to the grieving father next to his wife, Anne Morrow Lindbergh, um, that grieving father whose son was kidnapped from his crib and later found dead. Those are sort of the two threads of um, Charles Lindbergh, that, that story that still dominates his story. But there is a darker side, and Charles Lindbergh had layers and layers of secrets. I didn't know this when I began writing this book. I was actually researching the kidnapping and I planned on writing a true life sort of mystery. Um, but then I came across this picture. Next. The person with his back to you is Charles Lindbergh. Um, what's he doing? He's actually doing some secret experiments at the Rockefeller Institute of Medicine. He's trying to unlock the secret of eternal life. Um, for a council of his purpose is it's to eternal life for a council of white men 
is what he's is doing. A uh, council of white men who would live forever and then tell the rest of us mankind how to live. And when I discovered that picture, I had this first stirrings of that question that when you come across it, it changes everything. That question being, huh, really? I began, I knew then that I began that I would have to start looking underneath, or looking more at the historical record. And here's next. This is my historical record that's in my, still in my office. Um, I knew I needed to re-examine that historical record, those articles and speeches. I questioned and I poked at that record. I looked beneath the legend. I searched for the truth as best as I could. And I'm gonna be really honest here. It was a bit like looking under a rock. Um, because from an early age, what I discovered from an early age, Lindbergh thought he was a superior specimen physically and genetically. Um, this led to a lifelong belief in eugenics and he was still the, on the board of the American Eugenics Society in his death in the 1970s. He disdained democracy. He admired fascism and Hitler, next. Using his huge platform that came with his huge celebrity, he publicly and he unapologetically espoused racism, xenophobia, white supremacy. He advocated building border walls to keep out people of color. He called the media fake and he called Jewish Americans others. And he did this all through his uh, grassroots roots movement, next, um, America first. And in case you're not having enough fun yet, <laughs> um, this wholesome sort of morally upright person, this persona that he had, um, while he had that morally upright persona of being so wholesome, he had not one, but two, not one, not two, but three secret families. Um, needless to say, Charles Lindbergh, I found repulsive. Um, and I hesitated writing about him. I mean, I, I even asked myself, aren't biographies supposed to be inspirational? Aren't they supposed to be about men and women who rise up and overcome challenges, come together and do amazing things? So why bother to tell his story? And frankly, because I believe that um, we can only know about how to live in the present if we tell stories from our past. And that includes the less heroic stories, includes the stories that are ugly and even disturbing. After all, if heroes weren't flawed, we wouldn't have anything to learn from them. And so I ended up looking at, Lincoln, or at Lindbergh squarely and writing a history that will not always make the reader cheer, but I hope it will make them think and maybe that's sometimes more important. Um, I don't think I have to point out that, that how Lindbergh's story echoes our current American moment. I do believe, however, that it's his parallels between his time and our own that makes his story really contemporary. And it also raises lots of questions, including this one. Um, despite notwithstanding his flight into our history books, says he still deserve all those parks and schools um, and streets named after him? Does he still deserve those statues um, that he has? Um, teen readers are smart and they're curious. And I don't think I have to tell them the answer to those questions. What I do hope is that they will dive into this book and in places I'm sure they'll even wrestle with it. But I know fully, I have full confidence that they will find their way with it. So thank you. Thank you, Candy. Fascinating. Um, next up. Oh, and if you do have questions um, for Candy or anyone else as we go along, go ahead and, and get them in the Q&A section for us. Um, next up, we will hear from John Rocco. John is a number one New York Times bestselling author and illustrator of many acclaimed books for children, including Blackout, recipient of a Caldecott honor. Rocco has illustrated the covers for Rick Riordan's internationally best-selling series, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard, and The Trials of Apollo. He also created the illustrations for the number one New York Times bestsellers, Percy Jackson's Greek Gods and Percy Jackson's Greek Heroes. Before making children's books, John spent many years as creative director for Walt Disney Imagineering. If he couldn't make books, he would like to work as an engineer for NASA. He hopes this book will serve as his application. John lives in Rhode Island with his wife, daughter, and several demanding animals. 
Please take it away, John. Thanks, Ronnie. Hello. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Booklist, for hosting us. I'm here to talk about my book, How We Got to the Moon. And um, if we could, can I go full screen or is the slide stay up there? Because I have no slides. I just have me. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so I am, uh, I'm here to talk about this book. And uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came about deciding to write this book. Um, between 1968 and 1972, we sent human beings away from our planet to another celestial body, being the moon. Um, we haven't done it since. And in that four year span, uh, we sent 24 human beings so far away from the earth that they could actually see the whole thing. And this is a photograph I have. It was taken by Bill Anders on Apollo 8, coming back from the moon. And that image of the earth, I mean, when you think about only 24 human beings have actually seen the whole earth from space. And uh, it's, it's a pretty remarkable fact. And more remarkable is the fact that we did it in the 1960s when you know the height of technology uh, was pretty grim. I mean, you know, we, we didn't have, they didn't even have pocket calculators. They used slide rules and they used other, other types of, of uh, mechanical calculators. Um, so I've been reading about this for the longest time and uh, my wife suggested I make a book about it. And, and so I did and I, and I dove into it and created this book, which as you can see um, is heavily illustrated. Uh, it's 264 pages with about 500 paintings. Um, and it was so much fun to work on this book. So what happened for me was that I started doing all the research into, you know, the engineering behind the Apollo missions. And the more I dove in, the more fascinating it became. And what I realized was that they had an impossible problem. At the time, it was a completely impossible problem. Send human beings to the moon, get them back alive, and do it in 10 years. Um, they were able to throw a lot of money at this problem, but they, they also had to throw a lot of uh, brain power at this uh, problem. And what they realized was that it wasn't one big impossible problem. It was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, smaller problems. And as they tackled these problems, they could then string the solutions all the way to the moon and back. And so what I did with this book was I went into the actual engineering behind the Apollo missions, how they tackled all of these problems and how they found unique solutions in their own ways without the technologies that we have today. Um, and as I worked on this project, there were thousands of pages of material, uh, dozens of books that I went through, um, blueprints and everything from NASA is available and it's online, it's all there. Uh, but can you understand it? Can you, can I absorb that information and turn it around and put it into a form that can be understood by uh, most, most people from fifth grade and above? And that was a big challenge because there were a lot of areas where I just don't have the expertise. I don't understand it. Um, I did study engineering in college before I went to art school, but Still, when you're talking about uh, combustion instability in an F1 rocket engine, you know, how do you explain that? And so what I did was I went to the source and I started talking to dozens of Apollo engineers and asking them to explain it to me. 
And through that process, I, I had the most amazing experience. Um, some of them are my friends now, and uh, we talk quite often. Um, but I was able to put their own personal stories into this as well. So it's a combination of a history book, a science book, an engineering book, and, uh, and it uh, tells the story of how 400,000 people came together to do the impossible. And I think, you know, we live in a time where we have many more impossible problems to face. And uh, I wanted to shine a, a light on the Apollo era as a blueprint for how we can come together and solve these impossible problems. So um, take it away, Ronnie. Will do. Thank you, John. We will now hear from Cheryl Willis Hudson. Cheryl is an author, an editor, and co founder and editorial director of Just Us Books, an independent company that focuses on Black interest books for children and young adults. Cheryl has written over two dozen books for young children, is a member of the Children's Book Committee of PEN America, and has served as a diversity consultant to a number of educational publishers. Thank you so much for joining us today, Cheryl. Thank you, Ronnie. I'm really happy to uh, be here. Um, my book is Brave Black First, and this was a dream project for me because it gave me an opportunity to uh, write about and combine my love of biography, research, and African-American history. And it's presented in a really unique format for young readers as a work of nonfiction is beautifully illustrated and designed, supplemented with photography and lots of additional information because it was done in partnership with the Smithsonian and the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and to share a little bit of my process, especially uh, during the year, uh, which we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, which guaranteed women the right to vote. I had visited uh, the National Museum uh, twice in 2016 and 17, and really was blown away by its design, the amazing exhibit. So I readily accepted an invitation actually from my editor, Phoebe Ye, um, at Crown Random House to write a book, to write a text about women whose lives were portrayed and whose images were a part of this museum. So next, it was a collaborative project. Um, the research and inspiration started with really what I knew. Um, we had kind of a working title. We wanted to spotlight as many Black women as possible, but had a limited number of pages. And uh, so we started with a list of about 100 Black women. And my research and inspiration came from really a number of African-American women that I found out that I had actually met or knew, including the Library of Congress uh, I'm sorry, the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, Gwendolyn Brooks, Faith Ringel, Nina Simone, uh, Althea Gibson, Maya Angelou. Now I had not run around with all of these people in my personal life, but I had met them at conferences, had gone to book fairs. Uh, uh, Althea Gibson lived in East Orange, which is my home, um, had the opportunity of meeting Ruby Bridges through friends who had done books with her. Dorothy Height was another person that I met through Freedom Schools. Ruby D, Rosa Parks I met and my son had an opportunity to meet and also a uh, Toni Morrison. Next slide. Uh, Ruby Bridges literally walks into the pages of uh, this book. Uh, she was a freedom fighter and an upstarter. And the reason that a lot of these uh, people were curated was because they had done something that was brave. <laughs> uh, they were first and they were African-American and there was something in the museum uh, that connected with their lives. You'll see a picture there of George Ford, Burnett Ford, Ruby Bridges and my husband. We had dinner together when she was writing a book on her life uh, and she's a seminal character, a person who uh, walks through the pages of history now. You'll see her image everywhere with John uh, Rockwell who made it famous. Next. Next slide. 
So the, the, the book is designed in a way that there's a kind of immediacy with all of the women. Um, history is something that's a part of our lives and so much of African-American history is relegated or has been traditionally relegated to the margins. We only learn about it uh, during Black History Month when there are books in the store um, set aside in a certain section. So I wanted this uh, each biography to have an immediacy about that person's life. And you will see that in the reflected really in the drawings uh, of uh, Aaron Robinson, who did a fabulous job. Next. Faith Ringo um, is a creative artist. So you'll see that there are different categories. There are performing artists, there are educators, uh, there are politicians, and uh, Faith Ringo's a quilt maker. I love making quilts myself and had the opportunity to join her in a quilt making workshop. So I wrote about people that I knew that I admired, uh, but they had to be approved by the Smithsonian as well, and they had to be in the museum. Next. If you see up uh, through Althea Gibson, a, a sports figure, next. And all of these are just slides of um, the biographies of uh, important people who've made a contribution, not only to black history, but to the fabric of America, next. Katherine Johnson, a mathematician, was someone I was really inspired by. Actually, one of her contemporaries was a teacher at my high school before she went into NASA to be one of the computer experts. She was not in the film, but I was inspired by her life and that teacher, Mrs. Darden, who taught in my high school. Next. Obviously, sports and athletics is something that is a part of the inspiration for uh, many young people. And the character of Simone Biles is such an outstanding one in, in terms of not only how she flipped history, but just flipped period. Next. So they're historical figures and their contemporary figures. Harriet Tubman is one uh, who you will see biographies of in, in movies and um, we have done research online and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but again, inspiration from the lives of each one of these people. Next. So partnering with the Smithsonian was a great resource because they fact checked everything. Um, we had additional information you can see and you can imagine the seeing the, the clothing, the, the, the you are there feeling of seeing what Marian Anderson, for example, wore when she sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939. And it was uh, followed by a, a really wonderful experience, actually, that happened just before uh, COVID, uh, when uh, Aaron Robinson and I signed books at, uh, at the museum uh, for about two hours straight with hundreds and hundreds of, of children and, and people involved. I think that's the end of what I'm, and again, the index provides a lot of information um, because of the collaboration. If there's not information, in a double page spread of this person's inspirational life, you can find facts about each one of the Brave Black First in the index and the back matter of this book. So it was a wonderful dream come true for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, now that we've heard introductions to each of, of our three um, books, um, we will begin our panel portion of the webinar. So I invite everyone to, to turn on their video um, if they would like. Um, and I will begin with some questions of my own. Again, if you're in the audience, please um, send some questions in. We've already got a couple. Thank you very much. Um, but I wanted to start by sort of resetting um, by asking each of you um, a sort of well, to return to sort of the spark that, that kicked off the project for you. Um, and I ask this because you're all um, well-established um, authors. Um, I like to think that you have some control over what you do next. Um, so hopefully that's true. You, you can tell me if not, but um, what was it about your project that, you know, it had to be, you know, your next one? 
Um, and let's go back through the order that, we, that we've that we been going. So we'll start with Candy. Ask me again, what was what? <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, what was the spark that, that kicked off the project for you um, whenever that was? Right. It was, I had decided that I was going to do a book about um, the kidnapping. Um, that's what I went in interested in. And what I discovered is that Charles Lindbergh is as much of a mystery to me as that kidnapping. And that was the initial spark. Um, but I got into that research and I discovered how, like I had said earlier, how contemporary um, the issues that were um, that he was dealing with in his life, how contemporary they were, how they spoke to what was going on in our own world today. Um, and that was the spark that got me going. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me follow that up then, Candy. So you, mm -hmm. the, your book opens with one of the America First rallies, um, which is very chilling, especially if you aren't expecting it, um, as many probably won't be. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about, A, why you opened that way and um, if there are any other parallels that you that you see between then and now? Oh, it, it was a really intentional choice, um, that beginning, to start with that rally. And there were a couple of reasons. One, um, I wanted to signal to readers that this was not your traditional look at Charles Lindbergh. This was not um, that sort of heroic, shiny look at Charles Lindbergh. We haven't had a real reconsideration of Lindbergh in a while, I think. Um, so it's a real signal that this is not your typical biography, but also it really is um, um, a signal that the issues that the man that you're going to meet in this book has parallels to our own world. And, and by starting with a rally that surprises you, it sounds just like a Trump rally, and then you get to the end and you discover it's a Lindbergh rally. In many ways, I wanted readers to be as shocked as I was when I discovered it. When I read it, it was very eerie. So um, all of those reasons are the, you know, the purpose so that I can show, you, you know the parallels are coming. There's no doubt that the parallels are coming. And there are so many parallels in the book. Um, not only do you have this idea of the cult of personality and celebrity politicians, you have the issue of fake news, um, how technology forms public opinion. Um, wow, I, there's a million of them, suddenly I'm forgetting. Um, but there's just so many parallels um, today, grassroots movement, the rise of nationalism, white supremacy. Um, we think that we haven't seen it before in 2020, but we have seen it before. Yeah, very relevant for sure. Mm -hmm. What year did you did you start writing? Oh, I'm gosh. Um, oh, it feels like um, 1820, maybe. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, let me see, is it 2020? Uh, or probably three years ago. No. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's go to John. Um, you, you've, you've answered it in part, but um, but yeah, again, why was it the thing you had to do next? Especially because for you, it was a bit of a departure from, from your normal children's books. Yeah, what's normal? Well, I don't know. You know, I, 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 I've, done, I've done a lot of different things in children's books. I mean, I wrote a YA novel. Um, so I, I, don't, I just think of it as storytelling, whether it's a board book or, you know, something like this. And for me, uh, I was fascinated with the subject, you know, um, scared to death of like drawing thousands of rockets and engines and things like that. I'd rather maybe draw mice or something. But uh, it, I was fascinated with the science behind it. And the challenge of not only understanding that science, but but actually being able to teach that science in a way that's connected to story and a fascinating story. I mean, again, you know, the furthest we've been since 1972 is about that far from Earth. You know, it's not very far. It's like the distance between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And then in this four year span, uh, we sent people 240,000 miles out and we're about to do it again. Um, so, you know, for me, it was, it was just about like figuring out how to, how to connect all this stuff into a book that, uh, can explain the, the science behind it all. Yeah. So it's, it started with the science for you. Yeah, I think so. I, yeah. I mean, my father's a scientist and 
I've always been fascinated with science. And so it was a way to kind of connect, you know, the, the stuff I grew up with, with the stuff I'm fascinated with, with the career that I do now. Yeah. Just and you, you, you profiled so many figures throughout the book. Yeah. Um, so it ended up being a book as much about people as the science, as the story. So there's so many factors. Um, was it the science that dictated which people you highlighted or kind of what was the process? Um, for me, I, w I wanted to connect with different people, um, both, both, you know, for, for a lot of people, none of these people might be familiar. But, you know, of course, there's the, the Katherine Johnsons and, and the Gene Krantzes that, that people know about. But there's so many people that nobody knows about. And they've done fascinating work. Um, for instance, uh, uh, okay, I was looking at a photograph, and I don't want to take too much time, but I was looking at a photograph when I was researching the Launch Control Center, which is a room that has 450 people in it, um, men, uh, white ties, I mean, white shirts, black tie, you know, pocket protector. And I saw that there is this one woman in there. And I'm like, who, who is that? You know, and so I started doing more research. I find out her name is Joanne Morgan. And she started working at the, um, the uh, uh, ballistic missile range down in Cape Canaveral before they built Kennedy Space Center at 17 years old. And this woman has rocket fuel in her blood. And she went and studied her butt off and she went to school because this is what she wanted to do. And when Apollo 11 came around, she was the only woman in the launch control room. And so I called her up and she said, and this was uh, right, before, right before the Apollo 11 50th anniversary. And she said, why don't you come on down to Florida? We're having a get together with all the women who worked on Apollo. Wow. And these women all, I sat in a room with all these women, got to ask them questions about what they did. And it was everything from, I was a secretary or I, I wrote the checks to, I had to drive Buzz Aldrin's car from Texas to Florida. Every time he flew, I had to get his car there. And, um, but you can see she hasn't changed uh, a bit. Wait. <laughs> I think she's still bit. wearing the same dress. <laughs> <laughs> and Maybe. she is a powerhouse of a woman. So that led me to getting so excited about meeting all of these people and talking to them and hearing them stories. And, and they all kind of tied into one of the various systems, whether it be the parachutes or the engines or the, you know, the rescue team that, that got the astronauts out of the ocean. Um, and so I, I sprinkled those stories in to the specific areas where I talk about that system on the, on the mission. Yeah, fantastic, thank Sorry, you. Sorry, that was a little long-winded. I didn't mean to Please. take so much time. Please. That's why we're here. Cheryl, um, your turn. So you, you mentioned this was a dream project for you. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Please tell us more. I mean, did was your vision sort of um, satisfied by the end of it? Um, and yeah, where, where did you begin and where did you end up with it? I, I think I was very satisfied. I mean, I love research. I love African-American history. I love art. I love poetry. Uh, and so much of what I have done as a, a, an, an editor uh, has been around infusing more uh, African-American history into books for children, because that's something that I miss so much. Um, and so many children have missed in their growing up. When I grew up, that we, we had no books with black people in them. I mean, in the fourth grade, my history teacher hid the history book because it was so racist. But remember, I grew up during Jim Crow. I grew up in the South in all black schools, separate but equal, so um, separate but unequal. So the whole impetus, this was a dream project because actually I had just come home from a trip uh, to uh, Ghana uh, when the National Museum opened. And I was asked to write this book. And I think I was asked to write it because of some of the other books that I had written, textbooks and other biographies and other uh, books that I had edited from our company, Just Us Books. And having uh, 
actually a list of people who were first. I mean, I thought about my mother who was a, a black school teacher, but she was a French teacher and she taught French and she was one of the first black teachers to teach French and to teach it at an integrated school uh, during the, actually it was the seventies when the schools actually became desegregated in my hometown. So um, it was a dream come true because I could write about people that I knew that were really ordinary people, but, but extraordinary people. I mean, how many people uh, like Ruby Bridges exist in the world who went to the first grade as a six-year-old uh, being met by a screaming mob of people who didn't want to uh, let her go to school or, or took their kids out of school because the school was being integrated. So uh, history is something that is with us every day. And because uh, African-Americans have been so marginalized, it was a dream come true because, oh, I get to write. About, I thought, thought I was going to be able to write about 100, but we had to narrow it down to 50. And then when I went through a list, I found, wow, I've actually met 10 of these people, um, either you know at a book signing or a reading or uh, at a party. I went to a party and Nina Simone was there and played the piano. So I mean, oh my God, I can write something about because I know these people and other people should know about how extraordinary they are and that they are everyday people as, as well. So uh, working with the artists was wonderful too, because as you can see uh, from the book is, is illustrated uh, is uh, digitally, um, Aaron Robinson is a fantastic designer and illustrator, but through the research of hundreds and hundreds of photographs and going over sketches and knowing, knowing that she did research from photographs and from videos, she was able to capture kind of the spirit of uh, Aretha Franklin, the spirit of, of Ruby Bridges, the spirit of uh, of uh, Toni Morrison in those pictures. So I think the design really helps to move biographies in a way that sometimes photographs can't. But at the same time, we had uh, a lot of information that we weren't able to put in uh, the actual story and we included it in the back matter, which I think is sometimes just as important as the, the story itself to know the back matter. Definitely, it was very exciting to get to the end and then suddenly you've got new facts about pretty much everybody. Um, there's so much in there. Um, again, Cheryl, I, I love one of my, it's, you've written essentially a history book, but I love that it's a history book with living people, people who are, you know, dominating their field today and, and paving the way today. Um, and I think that makes it, makes history so much more accessible and, and relatable. Um, and I also love how there's this, this effect kind of emerged where you see the, the connections from the distant past to the present, um, from you know, the older, older folks who influenced today's people, um, like Bessie Coleman to uh, Mae Jemison and things like that. So I wonder if when you were selecting um, the, the, the subjects, were you keeping those connections in mind or was that just sort of an inevitable um, thing that, that came out of it? I think I kept it in, in mind, not, not consciously, but subconsciously, because uh, there are athletes. Bessie Coleman, uh, who was an aviator, was also a chemist. I mean, she studied science. Um, there are threads uh, of, of history that, I mean, there's not just one story uh, of what Ruby Bridges did when she integrated the school. There's not one story of Aretha Franklin, for example, whom uh, I saw uh, in concert and whom I loved and tried to emulate and sing her music and write the soundtrack of my life. Um, we all? <laughs> but I mean, come the on. fact that she was awarded a, 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 a Medal of Freedom by uh, uh, President Obama, um, and the fact that she was involved in many, in, in very strongly in civil rights and support of the civil rights movement, many people did not know that. But that thread ran through, and some of these people were involved in social justice movements because it was a part of their life. It's a part of their their art, whether it was Augusta Savage or uh, Mae Jemison or um, Katherine Johnson, uh, Nina Simone. Uh, you know, the, again, soundtrack of my, my my life and many lives. So I think it's just so important for children to be exposed to a range of experiences. So yes, that I kept that kind of in mind. And the interesting thing about this book is it's not chronological. 
Um, that was a decision that was made. It, it, it's not alphabetical, it's not chronological, it's not done in sections of the scientists, um, uh, uh, the politicians, the dancers, performers. It's all integrated and it, it flows together through the design and really the palette of the artists who put it together. So it was a historical project in that sense as well, in terms of how we work together. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Candy. Uh, we've, I've heard a bit more from the others about their, their research. Um, and I'm almost afraid to ask how much you did. I wonder if you can take us through your research journey, kind of what were your most reliable sources, um, and any kind of, I mean, research is a process of discovery, right? So kind of, what did you, what did you discover along the way? Oh, research, my research journey, it was a long one. Um, and, um, you know, research is always so organic. It's also really personal too, right? So, you know, nothing is more personal than your own research journey because you're asking the questions that matter to you or the things that you want to know. Um, for for me, the, my first sources were all the primary sources. So anything that the Lindberghs wrote, either Anne or, or Charles, um, and they wrote a lot. So, um, and they wrote well, which was pretty great for me. So they wrote, they would write pretty novelistically. Uh, Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh would actually write in present tense so that he was writing about events that happened in his life past, right? But he was writing it in the present tense so that you felt like it was happening at the very moment. Um, he would recall um, thoughts that he had at a, at a particular time and write them in present tense. And they would always, both of them record a lot of their dialogue or you know a lot of their conversations. They would actually write it like dialogue. They were both writers. Um, and so for me, that made my, my, my own research a lot easier because I too want to write novelistically, right? I'm writing nonfiction, but I'm not a, I'm not a fact teller, I'm a storyteller. So I have to write a story that reads like a novel that's narrative that kids will enjoy reading, teenagers will want to read. So that research made it, um, that, you know, their primary source material made it easier. Um, once I got a handle of what they were writing, and what they were saying about their lives, then I would look for other people in their lives that had left behind behind um, things that I could read, um, like um, Harold Nicholson, for example, who was at first their friend and then not. And so it's really always fun to find people who write about them that are not their best friends, that have some really wicked things to say about them, which I love. Um, not that I'm that really, that really, <laughs> um, But I do like a little good gossip, you know? Who doesn't? Um, yeah. And newspapers, magazines at the time, endless stories about the Lindberghs. They were always in the news. Um, good, sometimes, bad, often. Um, you know, the interesting thing about Charles Lindbergh is that he never really hid what um, he felt. He certainly said them out loud. You can read his speeches. You can hear his newspaper or his, I'm sorry, his radio um, speeches. You can hear them now. Um, but you can read it in his journals. He never, never, and he published those journals. He knew those journals were going to be published. And so he edited out a lot um, of things, um, uh, put things in the file there at Yale that you can't see. Um, but he actually edited out the stuff that he thought was probably not appropriate, but the things he left behind that he thought were just fine uh, about white supremacy and about his real feelings about Jewish Americans is fascinating and was shocking. Um, can, I, can I ask a question? You can. <laughs> I'll allow it. So, so <laughs> well, I mean, this, this kind of, you know, there's a lot of new things that you've said about Charles Lindbergh that I didn't know. Um, I, I, I did, was going to ask, did you did you touch upon him because he, in your well, moon? Very yeah. very slightly. Um, he he was actually at the Apollo Eleven launch. He was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I just what I found <laughs> fascinating was that he was two years old when the Wright brothers took off. So right. his lifespan kind of mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. you know, our our journey into the air and into space. Um, but no, I, what I wanted to ask you was about like our, our thinking and our mentality of what we hear, you know, 30 years ago. And we think, oh yeah, it's a little wacky, but eh, whatever. And today being 
more not hyper aware, but uh, you know, and I don't want to use the word woke, but just kind of like understanding that. I mean, for example, I last night I wanted to watch a movie that I haven't seen in a long time. It was called Working Girl. We all know this movie, <laughs> right? 19, 1988, it came out. Yeah. Every black person in that movie is a servant. Mm -hmm. a wedding mm -hmm. or bringing tea and coffee to the meetings. I didn't notice it when I first saw the movie, you know, and now I'm watching it going, holy crap. Like, so, so you're asking me if you so think yes. like anti-Semitism and stuff was a thing of his time. And, and so we look at it from the 20, 20, 2020 and we go, ooh, that's reprehensible. But back then it was common. Right. Charles Lindbergh, Lindbergh was extreme. Lindbergh was extreme. So what he was working on was think about this. What he was working on were secret experiments so that white, a certain number of white guys would live forever and tell the rest of us how to live. Um, he was all, I mean, he was a eugenicist and he was, think about this, he was a eugenicist until the time he died in the 1970s, so much so that he was still paying money to it and he was still sitting on the board. And this is 30 years after, after the Holocaust. And Lindbergh was there in May, um, right after, two weeks after Hitler surrendered, he was there. So he was not a guy that was changing his opinions. And no, yeah, he was extreme. And everyone knew he was sort of extreme. What I love about America. We still named all of these streets after him and all the schools. I guess that's my point is like. And know. we did. And like 1920s, <laughs> 1930s, 1940s, I mean, you know, there were Americans that stood up and went, this is not, this is not, um, this is not America. He made that speech in Des Moines and the next day people repudiated him. Um, people in Congress <gasps> repudiated those words that he said. Um, um, which is one of those things that I love about the story that Americans didn't really stand for it. They, they, they really put him in his place and put him away, put him aside for years um, as not their national hero. And yet he hung on, you know. We have some, uh, some audience questions related to that, Candy. Um, I'm trying to, to decide which one. Um, Constance, I believe, asked, as far as what we're talking in the classroom now and about your readers. Um, well, she, her specific question is, what advice do you have for students who find out something that they don't want to believe about someone they viewed as heroic? Oh, that's a tough one. What advice do I have? <laughs> Please help me out with this. Um, you know, I, I wanna just say, mm, look around. Maybe there's another story that they found it only once. Maybe it's, it's not good information. Um, but if it is good information, then sometimes you have to ask yourself why. So you learn more about that person, I think, sometimes by the, by the, by the, I don't want to say bad things, that sounds so simple, simplistic, but by the bad things that they do. Sometimes you learn more about them that way, um, through those, through that, than you do about the things that they accomplish. And I'm thinking, like, specifically about, like, Amelia Earhart, when I did Amelia Earhart, and I discovered during the process that she wasn't particularly truthful. She made up a lot of stuff out of whole cloth, right? She, all right, she told lies, and she told them frequently. Um, and you might want to say, ah, oh, that's just makes her a bad person. Then you have to ask why, why did she behave like that? And what I discovered was that the reason was that she's a woman working in the thirties and she's got her twenties and thirties. She has to make herself palatable to the public because she needs them to come um, pay for her lectures. She needs them to come buy her books because she needs that money. Why does she need that money? Because she wants to fly. And it's all she wants to do is fly. So you begin to put those flaws into that person's life. Why did they behave that way? I don't know if that will help the student, but and with yeah. Charles Lindbergh, I never did figure out. I, I spent my entire process and the entire writing of this book. And even now today I go around and I go, why Charles? Why? Why? You know, poor, poor Eric is so tired of hearing me go, do you understand that? Do you understand yeah. that? Yeah. A lot of people are asking about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's keep talking about the classroom and about the readers. Uh, Cheryl, I know you pay a lot of attention to libraries and, and schools. Um, 
have, did you, your book came out in the old days before the pandemic. Did you get a chance? <laughs> that was worth the old days. <laughs> times before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the before times. Did you get a chance to, I mean, you, you mentioned the museum, the museum signing, which sounded amazing. Did you get a chance to speak to a lot of readers kind of, um, and educators about, about how, like their response to the book? I did at the at the museum itself. Well, the, the I think our book signing was in February, um, and uh, it was during the day. It was in the lobby of the National Museum. It was during the day that there was also a STEM conference going on. So the book signing was not held in the bookstore itself. It was held in the lobby. And if you've been to the National Museum, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful place. There were young kids all around making robots and and uh, there were lots of teachers there and uh, we were right in the middle of it so some people who didn't even know about the book came by just to see what was going on and um, talked with them then and I've had a lot of uh, zoom visits uh, had maybe one or two visits prior to the uh, sequestering from the pandemic uh, but the response has been I didn't know that. I didn't know that there were so many people who did these kinds of things. And that's the that's kind of the tragedy of, of I can't say of black history, but of education in the United States. So much of our history, history of indigenous people, um, history of what has been termed the other has been left out of textbooks, of trade books, uh, of uh, media of movies, as John had uh, mentioned. You know, I went to a, a all black elementary school, junior high school, high school. And even by the time I had graduated um, in the 60s, um, the school system in my hometown wasn't desegregated really until the 70s. Um, so you think about Lindbergh and you think about perceptions that people have of history and what's fair and what's equal and what's white supremacy. But th that kind of thing has been around for a long time and it's impacted everything in our culture, everything in our classrooms. Um, I started my career in publishing, uh, working for a textbook publisher. And one of the first things that I did as an art director, uh, I was an art trainee, editor trainee at that time, was to color in the faces of the, all the white kids, because all the books, everybody in the books were, were white. And that was 1970, that was 50 years ago. Uh, so that's in a lifetime. So a lot of things have changed and it takes a lot to bring about that change and also to question the assumptions of whether children should go to the same school. That's ridiculous, Every, sure, sure, everybody has a right to an education, but why do you have separate but equal? So you have to uh, really question so many assumptions about how we are taught history and how we are taught all kinds of subjects in the classroom. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but yeah, we do yeah. get a lot of questions from students. Uh, of, well, why, why don't I know this? Mm -hmm. You know, wh why isn't this information available? Cheryl, do you want to just take a second to, to talk about Just Us Books? I just want to make sure our audience knows about it. Uh, Just Us Books is a publishing company that my husband and I started uh, over 32 years ago, and we uh, wanted to have, uh, we had some ideas for children's books. I had worked uh, in publishing, my husband's a writer, and we took our manuscripts to um, almost every publisher in, in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, <laughs> and uh, they, they were rejected. It was a, a simple book called uh, Afrobet's ABC book, that using letters of the alphabet, uh, African-American kids, something about African culture. So A is for apple, Africa, and alligator. Uh, and, and people say, oh, that's, that, why would you do a book about that? No, nobody's going to buy that. Black parents don't buy books, don't read. So anyway, long story short, we started our own publishing company, really first to self-publish, uh, but then expanded. There was so much demand for what we were, were doing um, that we began publishing biographies and poetry and fiction. Um, middle grade readers. And we've been in business for 32 years now. So we publish African-American black interest books for all, for all children. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John, uh, your book came out October. Yes. Have you, have you had a chance to digitally connect to Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've done maybe a dozen or so 
events digitally. Um, and uh, as far as connecting to readers, I've, I've heard from a lot of different readers, uh, which has been fascinating to me. Um, I've heard from, you know, engineers who work in the aerospace industry that, you know, tell me this is the best book on Apollo I've ever read, you know, and I've heard <laughs> from kids who are just like, this is, you know, great. And, and um, I've heard from uh, librarian, like, uh, you know, through different like reviews and advanced praise and stuff. Um, it's been really fascinating to see the different kinds of people that have been interested in this book, whether it be fans of space or fans of science or, or just, you know, kids who want to like read about this stuff. And, yeah. and, and there's so much that um, I'm, I'm always shocked at what, you know, the average person doesn't know about what went into getting to the moon. Um, and I was, you know, also floored by, by what I didn't know when I started doing the research. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's marketed as a middle grade book, but I, I do think, I mean, it goes for yeah, all ages, I, you essentially. Know, I mean, they, the, thing, the thing about publishing, as we <laughs> all know, is they want to put it in a box somewhere. You know, what shelf does this go on? What, you know, and, and uh, I, I don't normally create that way. I don't, you know, it's not that I don't think about the reader. The reader is me. Right. Yeah. So what I like to create is like I wanted to create a book that I would have loved as a kid. I would have loved now. Uh, so, you know, that's that's what I do. But, you know, they, they do, you know, part of marketing and publicity is is saying this is where it's going to go. This is where, you know, we're going to target and and that. But, um, yeah, I've had people from, you know, eight years old to 95 years old respond with, I love this book. Yeah. <laughs> so that has been very rewarding, just yeah. hearing that kind of feedback, for sure. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. It's my proudest thing that I've done in my life. Right on. Folks, we've barely scratched the surface, but I have to honor everybody's time. Um, because we are out of time. Um, in the audience, we, we did end up getting quite a few questions um, that we won't answer live, but we will get those questions to you after the webinar. So if you'd like to follow up um, directly, we can make that happen. Um, but thank you panelists all for, for joining me. This was really fun. Um, I wish we had more time. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody, thank you. Thanks. All right. And just some closing notes. For more about the titles discussed today and the latest news from Random House Children's Books, you can follow RHCB Educators on Twitter. You can also download free resources for virtual learning, including discussion guides at rhteacherslibrarians.com. I will give one more big thank you to Candy, John, and Cheryl for taking the time. Um, it was a true pleasure. Go get their books. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, a certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. If you have not yet, be sure to check out Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post about the latest book news and reviews. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. One more thank you to our sponsor, Random House Children's Books. This concludes today's webinar. <laughs>